Hello friends, this video on neat atoms is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Then came the Bohr's atomic model. Now in Bohr's atomic model, there were some uh, important and basic postulates about this model. So Bohr's atomic model was applicable for hydrogen and all hydrogen like atoms. Now what do we mean by hydrogen like atoms? So hydrogen like atom would include any such atom which has uh, one electron revolving around it. For example, helium plus. Now since it loses one electron to form helium ion, so helium ion is, an hyd is a hydrogen like atom. Similarly, lithium plus plus. So lithium with, I mean the normal lithium has three electrons but the moment it is plus plus that means two electrons are lost. So now it has only one electron. So lithium plus plus is also a hydrogen like atom. Okay, so now let's see what were the postulates of the Bohr's atomic model. So it said that the electrons revolve around nucleus in certain stable orbits without emitting radiations. So it said that, okay, this is fine that the electrons revolve around the nucleus, but it is not that electron can revolve around the nucleus anywhere. So there are some specific orbits in which electrons can revolve and they can revolve only in those orbits and those orbits are stable such that when electrons revolve in those orbits they do not emit any radiation. Right. So the most important part of Bohr's model was that electrons now revolve only in specific orbits only in certain orbits. Now electron revolve in orbits in which angular momentum mvr is equal to nh by 2 pi. So this is a very important relation. So this shows that, the, in fact we call this as the Bohr's quantization condition. This is called Bohr's quantization condition. Why do we call this like why, why do we call this so? That's because here we have quantized the angular momentum of electrons. Now here m represents the mass of electron, v is the velocity with which the electrons revolve and r is the radius of the orbit in which the electrons move. Right? Now this is equal to n h by 2 pi where n is the principal quantum number. Now the value that n can take could be any integer starting from 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So that would be the value of n. So now you see th this means that the electrons would be present in some specific orbits only in those orbits where this relation holds true. Correct. So this was the most important uh, postulate of Bohr's atomic model and because of this postulate only all the drawbacks of the Rutherford's model could be overcome. Now when electron receives energy, okay, so now we understand that if this is the nucleus, still now we understand if this is nucleus, then electrons will revolve only in some specific orbits, so not beyond them. So there, an electron cannot exist between these two orbits. So there are some specific orbits in which only the electrons are allowed to move. Now when an electron receives energy, it jumps from ground state to excited state. Now when we talk about these uh, orbits, so these orbits are basically the energy levels because as you move uh, to different orbits, the energies are also different in different orbits, right? Now the electron, an electron can jump from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. So the lowest energy level is called the ground state and the higher energy levels are called the excited state, right? Now, for an electron to move from the ground state to the excited state, it needs some energy, right? As, as I was telling you that, let's say that if, if you want to uh, climb the mountain, so you need some energy right to climb the mountain because the effort is more so who has to provide that energy so that ha energy has to be provided externally so here also the same thing happens when electron receives some energy it jumps from ground state to excited state but in the excited state electron is not in a stable situation so electron will stay in that excited state only momentarily and then it will fall back 
right now when the electron falls back or when the electron returns back from higher energy level to lower energy level then it releases energy in the form of electromagnetic waves so it is just the opposite thing so when it has to go from lower energy level to higher energy level it takes energy when it falls back from higher energy level to lower energy level then it releases the energy so very simple so if you look at this let's say that these are the energy levels now as the value of n increases n represents the principal quantum number because n can be 1 n can be 2 n cannot be anything between 1 and 2 right so as the value of n increases the energy levels also increases right so n is equal to 1 this represents the ground state and all of these are the excited state so let's say that there is an electron which is in the ground state and the electron receives some energy from outside because of which it is able to go to the excited state n is equal to 3 but it stays at n is equal to 3 only for some time and then it falls back now the moment it falls back it releases some energy out right so when going from ground state to excited state it takes energy while coming back from excited state to ground state it releases energy and this energy which is released is released in the form of electromagnetic waves right so here we talk about another concept which is called Bohr's frequency condition so what we understand is the difference between the energies of these two levels let's say that the energy at n is equal to 1 is e1 the energy at n is equal to 3 is e3 energy at n is equal to 2 is e2 so let, let's say because the energy at every level is different so in this case we are talking about excitation from e1 to e3 so we can say that the difference between the energies of these two levels will be equal to so this difference in energy is equal to h nu where nu is the frequency of the radiation which is released like if the electron is coming from i mean falling back from e3 to e1 in that case the energy which is released will have a frequency nu such that e3 minus e1 is equal to nu right or you can also understand it in this fashion that when you give some external energy let's say that this external energy is h nu so when you give this external energy to e1 which is the ground state then it is able to go to the third state that is e3 so e1 plus h nu is equal to e3 so you see both of these are the same thing so two ways of uh, writing the same thing so this basically tells you the excitation from e1 to e3 and this tells you the uh, falling back from e3 to e1 so this was the concept of Bohr's atomic model and this relation is known as the Bohr's frequency condition so let us now quickly talk about Bohr's radius now for hydrogen atom now there are a lot of calculations that we normally do for hydrogen atom to find out the radius of its orbit to find out the velocity of the electron in the orbits so we, we find out expressions for that so uh, the radius of the first orbit of hydrogen atom is given by h square epsilon naught divided by pi m e square where all of these are constants h is the Planck's constant which is 6.63 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space whose value is 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 pi is 3.14 m is nothing but mass of the electron and e is the charge on an electron so if you put all these values and you try to calculate it you get value of r1 as 0 0.53 angstrom so this much is the radius of the first orbit of hydrogen atom now as i have mentioned before that bohr's atomic model is applicable for hydrogen atom and hydrogen like atoms right so 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 this is how we calculate the radius of first orbit of hydrogen atom now what about the radius of nth orbit because for hydrogen like atoms they have more atomic numbers right so there might be electrons in nth orbit in the second orbit third orbit or fourth orbit right so how do we calculate the radius of nth orbit so 
the radius of nth orbit is related to the radius of the first orbit like this r n is equal to n square by z into r1 so for hydrogen where z is the atomic number for hydrogen z is 1 and what is n n represents the principal quantum number like as as we were discussing just now the principal quantum number decides the energy level or it you can say that it decides the orbit because here n represents the number of the orbit like radius of the second orbit so in that case n is equal to 2 if you want to calculate radius of fifth orbit so in that case n is equal to 5 so n basically represents the number of the orbit also so we can say that radius of nth orbit is n square by z into r1 now let us talk about the speed of electron in nth orbit so this is about Till now we were discussing only about the radius but the electron moving in an orbit will also have a speed of its own. So how do we calculate that speed? Now from Bohr's postulate we have already learned from the Bohr's quantization condition that mvr is equal to nh by 2 pi. So this was Bohr's quantization condition. Right? So from this we can say that velocity is equal to nh divided by 2 pi mr. Right? Now we know that radius of the nth orbit is equal to just now we wrote n square by z into r1 and we know the value of r1. So rn or radius of nth orbit can be written as h square epsilon naught divided by pi m e square into n square by z so this is the radius of the nth orbit so basically we know the value of rn so we can put this value of rn here so if you put this value of rn here this is the expression that you get for vn which is the speed of electron in the nth orbit so let us do that so we can say that vn is equal to nh divided by 2 pi m into 1 by rn that is pi m e square into z divided by h square epsilon naught n square so h and n will get cancelled with this so pi pi will get cancelled m m will get cancelled so we are left with z e square divided by 2 h epsilon naught n so you see this is the exact expression that we have got. So this is how we can calculate the speed of an electron in the nth orbit. Now you see there is no need to memorize all the formulae. So if you just know how to uh, calculate the radius of first orbit of hydrogen atom, you can very easily find out how do you want to calculate speed of electron, how do you want to calculate radius of nth orbit, they become very simple. Now let us talk about the frequency and time period for these electrons which are moving in orbits. So let us first talk about frequency. So we know that we generally denote frequency with nu. So frequency of electron in the nth orbit will be equal to the angular frequency divided by 2 pi because this is how the angular frequency this, this is how the angular velocity and the frequency are related, right? So now, this angular velocity, how is the angular velocity related to the linear velocity? So r into omega n will be equal to vn, right? r omega is equal to v. So here the n subscript is only for the nth orbit. That means angular velocity of in the nth orbit linear velocity in the nth orbit so omega n can be written as v n divided by r so nu n that is frequency in the nth orbit is equal to velocity speed in the nth orbit divided by 2 pi r right so just in the previous slide we had calculate the value for v n so let us put that value so we get z e square divided by 4 pi n epsilon naught h r so this can be written as 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into z e square divided by n h r. So 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is k. So k into z e square divided by n h r. So this is the expression for frequency of electron in the nth orbit. Now what about time period? So we know that time period 
of revolution of electron in nth orbit is equal to 1 by frequency. So time period and frequency are reciprocal of each other. So since we know this, now we can put this value of frequency. So we get nhr divided by kz e square. Right. So from this, what we understand is the time period is proportional to n by z into rn. This r is nothing but radius in the nth orbit. Correct. Now here h is a constant, k is a constant, z uh, and e is a constant. So the only values which might change are n, z and rn. And we have seen that rn if you talk about Rn, it is proportional to it n squared by z. So Rn is directly proportional to n squared and inversely proportional to z. So based on that, we can say that Tn will be directly proportional to n cube divided by z square because Tn is proportional to n by z into Rn and Rn alone is dependent on n square by z. So Tn will be dependent on will be proportional to n cube by z square and therefore you can say that frequency will be proportional to z square by n cube that's because frequency and time period are reciprocal of each other. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com for free quality education. You can learn with a simple four step learning process wherein you can watch video lessons, you can ask your questions, you can refer notes and you can take a free online test. We have content for class 6 to 12 on physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology along with practical videos. So please subscribe to our channel for daily updates. Thank you.